as I said in the opening of our show, my first guest tonight is one of this country's top singer, composers, and songwriters, and also a photographer who has an exhibit which is just opening here in New York at the Hammer Galleries, which please welcome Mr. John Denver. <laughs> Your photographic hobby, talents, or ambitions have not been widely talked about. In fact, I was surprised to learn that you have an exhibit of photographs uh, uh, which are on sale here in New York now at the Hammer Galleries. When did all this start? Well, I've been taking pictures since I was in high school, you know, snapshots mm -hmm. and like that. But it's something that I enjoyed a great deal and started to work at and work with. Over the past couple of years, it's been a great source of relaxation for me, a, a great comfort in times when the world gets going very fast in my head. And people seem to like the photographs. I've given many out as gifts to friends and, and like that. And then the chance came to, uh, to do this show with David Armstrong at the Hammer Gallery. David is watercolor, an yes. incredible watercolor artist. And to do so in benefit of the Windstar Project. And uh, it was too good a chance to pass up. And so this is the first show that I've ever done. And I've been very pleased with how it's gone so far. So then John Denver is not simply exhibiting his photographs as an ego trip saying, hey, look at me, I take great pictures, but rather there's a, a motivation behind it for this project that you call Windstar. Yes, sir, absolutely. All right, now before I get to that, you use the phrase, when the world gets to going too fast in my head. From watching you perform and from reading about you, one would get the idea that you are the most relaxed, the most casual, most unaffected of all the superstars, and that nothing ever really gets too cluttered up in your head. When does the world start going too fast for you? Well. Life is getting pretty complex for me, and uh, I do try to maintain a good balance in my living, in the things that I do, and I feel that I've, I've done that fairly well. At the same time, I keep getting busier and busier and, and expanding in all kinds of ways. It's not just doing, like this year we did a concert tour, we did 125 concerts in 100 cities across the United States. I've done two television shows, I've just finished recording an album. During that time, I also served on the Presidential Commission on World and Domestic Hunger over the last two years. So uh, quite often when I had free time to go home, I ended up going to Washington, D.C. to work in that regard. Uh, I've been to Washington several times working for the Alaska Lands Bill, which just yesterday was signed into law. And uh, oh, it was a wonderful day. I was so happy about that. But anyway, so, so like I, I get in this thing. I, I get rolling about things, and like we had our opening here Monday night. I, f I flew in from, uh, from Los Angeles. Monday night we had our opening. Tuesday morning I flew down to Washington to be present at the signing of, of the bill. Flew back here for interviews and like that yesterday around this photography show. I've been doing interviews all day today. Uh, plus Probably the last thing you need tonight is this, but thank you for coming. <laughs> I'm, no, I'm pleased to be here, but, but it's just, you know, it's like it seems that I have an enormous opportunity to do a lot of things, and I happen to be interested in a lot of things, care about a great many things. And I, some of them I can't pass up. And quite often, it, it, it all gets going very, very fast. And what I want to do, and how I, one of the ways that I keep myself steady, if I can't go walking out in the woods, uh, if I can't go fly an airplane, is I can pull out my camera. And even in my hotel room, I can sit down and, and, and focus right down here on this little thing. And it's very relaxing. Why don't you slow up a little bit? Why must you do 125 cities and race down to Washington and do all these projects and get Windstar going? and make all these records. Why can't you just pull back a little bit? Well, I don't know that I can't. It's just that I haven't yet. And when I finish this week here in New York and go back to Los Angeles, I have to remix a couple of things on the album. I absolutely intend to go home and not do anything for as long as I can see not out doing there anything. right now. Yeah, yeah. And see if I can slow down. I think it's difficult for me to be still, really. What is Windstar, John? Windstar is a project in Colorado that has to do, in my mind, with becoming a tool to, to really affect a lot of the things that I care about in the world. We tell people about Windstar that it has three basic purposes. One is an educational facility. We had 17 college students there this summer working with us. Uh, they get full credit for being there, I think uh, nine credit hours, and uh, working with us on the retrofit on the existing building on the property and helping us with what we're doing with gardening. With it. It's an educational facility in that regard. It's also a res research and development center for alternative energy sources. Windstar, the sun and the wind. We have on the retrofit in the building that we have now an example of every kind of solar technology that exists in the country today, especially those and demonstrable uh, those that people can put on their own homes very easily. Uh, we feel that 
by the year 2000, 80 percent of the buildings that will exist in the year 2000 have already been built. We're living in them right now, exactly. working in them right now. And to, make, to handle some of our energy concerns, we're going to have to retrofit those buildings, make them more energy efficient. That'll be a much more uh, inexpensive path to pursue than building new buildings. So we can demonstrate to people uh, things that are, are viable, things that perhaps they can use in their own homes when they come to visit us at Windstar. It's a research and development center in that regard. We're going to be, by the time we get our major building finished, we will be a small energy exporter. We will be creating more energy than we need for our facility, feeding some through the wind generator back out into the power grid for other people to make use of. So then Windstar is not an amusement park, it's not a recreational facility, it's not a place one goes for a vacation, but rather it's an educational and research facility. Absolutely. Point. And then the third part of Windstar is that there are a lot of places like that around the world. There are a lot of groups of people who are starting to look at some of the things that I've been looking at lately. And with my opportunity to travel to the extent that I have with my music, I meet a lot of these people and find, boy, you know, there's somebody over here that you guys ought to get to know. And they don't know of each other. And one of the things that we think we can do with Windstar is network that, that aspect of people and living all over the planet. Why do we make such fun of solar energy and its applications? For example, have you seen these little toys that are now selling in some of the expensive boutiques? They're $100, $150. And there'll be a little uh, solar cell that makes a little tiny uh, uh, copper wire windmill go around. I mean, they make little knickknacks out of solar power. And to me, that kind of, uh, kind of demeans solar energy. It makes it look like it's just a toy, that it really has no practical applications. Well, I think that, that I, I agree with you to a great degree, but also I think that it starts to put it out there so that people, and perhaps they can even look out there far enough to know that we have the wherewithal to put in space a solar power satellite, 10 of which could provide all of the energy needs of the United States of America. Now, I bet you didn't know that. No, but I remember seeing pictures, and remember the old Willie Lay books that we saw as kids yeah. of, of the, uh, what it was going to be like in 1980? Yeah. And the big paddle wheel things up in space with mm -hmm. the solar panels on that would be sending energy down to the earth? They always write about the future 40 years from now as if it's going to be wonderful. And then we do the 40-year time span, and it isn't that wonderful. Look at how they pictured the city of the future in 1939 at the World's Fair. Our cities today bear no relationship to what people thought they would look like 40 years ago. And why is that, do you suppose? I don't know. Well, you know, the thing is, it's like part of what you describe seems to be so foreign to people, at least in regard to what we know of solar technology today. The truth is, we have all the technology necessary to create those space platforms which I've described. We have had it for several years, and if we have been working on it to the extent that we've been working on supporting nuclear power development in this country, the cost, the cost gets to be pretty close to the same. And if we had been a little bit more supportive of our space program, uh, to the degree that the space shuttle itself had gone a little bit faster, we might have one of those power stations up there working right now. Before we get too far away from the photographs that you have on exhibit here along with the watercolors, uh, can we just show a couple we haven't loaded on the machine and they'll pop up here on the screen? You. All right, be my pleasure. George, want to put the first one up here and you'll tell me the title. I've got a list, but I've lost it. This is called Country, Country Roads. Road, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> one of the things I'd like to do with my photographs is perhaps take a song like Country Roads and, and, and fill it with pictures of Country Roads all, all over the country, all over the world. Okay, next one. Ha oh, ha, this is called Hanging Out in Beverly Hills. <laughs> one of the things that I, uh, I do, as I mentioned, when I'm on the road traveling is I'll pull out my camera, walk around the hotel room, or walk around outside. And this is in the gardens uh, outside the Beverly Hills Hotel about a year or so ago. There were quite a few snails. I found this one and tried to see what I could do with them. And uh, I put him up on the flower. The flower is a bird of paradise, I think. And all of a sudden it built over and he was upside down and quickly I got the camera and took the picture. I think it's about to take a big bite out of that, uh, that California. Looks like it, yes. Looks like it. <laughs> Next one's called South of San Simeon, also in California. Oh, this is Saba Sales. This is down in the, uh, the Caribbean. And, uh, oh, excuse me, the, I thought it was San Simeon, California. Uh, well, there, there is a photograph by that name uh, that's, that's in the show. This is called Saba Sales. The volcanic okay. island that you see across there is called Saba. And uh, the boat you know, I had to wait for about 45 minutes for that boat to get right where I wanted it. But that's where it is, mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. where I wanted it. Mm -hmm. This is called Lily of the Nile, and this is, uh, some people sent me a, a bouquet of flowers, not unlike this, it happened to be Lily of, of the Nile, and one day sitting around in my hotel room, pulled the camera out and took that photograph. Now, I don't see any pictures of people. I find it uncomfortable to take pictures of people. Not not to a great degree. I have a picture of, of the Pope. I have a picture of a bicyclist riding home over in England uh, that I took about a year ago. 
if the people are far away so that you can't necessarily see them and they are not so aware of me, I can do that. But, but otherwise, to be close enough to where you might be able to identify the people or where they obviously have the sense of me having a camera on them, I've not been able to do that. What, do you feel you're invading their privacy or surprising I, them? I do feel that, that it is an intrusion. I, and I've, I've thought about that, and it, that's what it, is, what it is to me. And it's because I feel myself on this end of the lens so very often. And sometimes it's to be expected. Sometimes it is an intrusion. And I absolutely you know, I don't want to do that to people. All right, I must pause here for a couple of seconds. I want to show a couple of the watercolors of David Armstrong, who are also in this show at Hammer. We'll continue with Mr. John Denver right after these announcements. Back now with John Denver, uh, uh, David Armstrong, his watercolors. Why are they a part of this exhibit, as well as your photographs? Well, the, the exhibit totally has to do with David Armstrong. He's been at the Hammer Gallery. Uh, this is his fourth exhibit there. And uh, he had this show set up. And out of our friendship and his interest in Windstar, mm -hmm. uh, he wanted to do the opening night of his show as a benefit for Windstar, uh, which, which was in the works anyway. And then as we, uh, as we talked over the past summer and he, started, he saw some of my photographs, he invited me to come be with him, which was a, an incredibly generous thing to do in my mind. And uh, so I, I totally owe the opportunity of showing these photographs and using them to raise money to Windstar uh, to him. All right, let's take a look at the little of the work here of uh, Mr. David Armstrong. This is called On Bierstadt's Trail. And uh, the thing about David is that he goes out. He, most of his work is of his environmental. And he goes out and sits there to do that picture. You know, I mean, he doesn't go out and take a photograph and, and then go back, back home. The fire, right? He likes to be in the environment. He likes to have the smell, the wind, everything that goes on with that to sit and, and, and do his work. And it, it really comes through in his painting. Are these pieces terribly expensive? Gee, I don't know. Uh, they run, I think his pieces run from about $1,500 up to as much as $25,000. Well, $1,500 is not terribly expensive for an original watercolor. So I, I, not, I not don't know. I'm in foreign territory on, on that. Uh, that. That picture there called uh, uh, One Last Run, you know, uh, uh, a, a, yeah, yeah. the sled there. See, mm -hmm. I mean, not anybody, but to me it looks, I can just see the kids when the snow was still there. They did that last run and they got called into dinner, which is what's going on right where that light is right now. You know, it just starts to bring a whole lot of pictures to me. Mm -hmm. And that's the thing I love about his work. I think he's incredibly talented. What about John Denver? Can we talk about John Denver for a couple of minutes here? <laughs> uh, in reading about you this afternoon, yes. it's, been, it's been some years since you had a really number one hit Big Smash single record. Yes. Is that a source of pressure to you considering the enormous number of successful records that you've had? No, I don't consider it uh, pressure. You know, it's something I'm mindful of. I'd love to have another hit record. But I'm not trying... You know, that's not what I'm trying to do, is write hit records. What I'm trying to do is write songs that express how I feel about life, the experiences that I've had, the things that I see going on around me, in a way that I hope people can relate to. But then you're being very chancy. You're saying, if this happens to catch on with what people's, what people's minds are on these days, or what their stream of consciousness reflects, then it'll be a hit record. If not, so be it. So very, be it. Very chancy. And, and the thing is, is that for a period of time, that is exactly what happened. Uh, what I wrote, what I sang, reflected the feelings of a whole lot of people, and I was perhaps the biggest record-selling artist in the country for a time. And, uh, you know, nothing stays the same. There is change, and after that, music has changed a lot. Uh, there was the whole disco thing that happened that went on for a little over a year or so, and that's all you could hear, and that's all that really the hit records were. Now with what's going on in country music, and not so much country music, <coughs> excuse me, the way that I've done it, but the kind of sounds that, you know, what they call the outlaw music, uh, the kind of soft sounds that Kenny Rogers are doing now. He's got an incredible success, you know? Mm -hmm. And perhaps that will come back for me in the form of those records. At the same time, I really feel good about what I'm trying to do out there because I can go out on a tour now, as I've done this past year, and whereas a lot of people with hit records are really having difficulty selling out concerts, and in fact, a lot of concert tours are, are, are breaking down about halfway through, we did all these concerts, and I would say we averaged from 85, 90%, 95% full throughout the country, and that's without that hit record. So there's still an audience out there for my kind of music, and it is still meaningful to them. And that's what I want to continue reaching for and continue sharing. You described a while ago the business of your life, the 125 cities, the concert tours, the trips to Washington, the commitments you have in records in Hollywood, television appearances, etc. 
All of this, of course, is carefully watched by the press of this country. And, of course, they <laughs> wonder what pressures it puts upon Mr. and Mrs. John Denver, their family life, and articles that appear in magazines such as People and Us. How do you handle that constant being in the fishbowl, that constant glare of publicity surrounding you and your loved ones? Do you slough it off, ignore it, respond to it, worry about it, fret about it? No, I, I'm just aware that it's there. It's part of the life that I've created for myself, and I try to be very honest about it with my family and with the press, with the media. Uh, there are aspects of my life which are public, and there are aspects of my life that I try to do everything I can to keep as pri private and normal as possible. And sometimes those get wiggly-woggly, whatever, and it's just something that you have to deal with, and I think as long as you are honest and open on both sides of, of the situation, that it's not something that you have to worry about. What about the 4,000-gallon gasoline tank? Well, remember when that came out? Oh, yes, a lot sir, of us said, well, 16,000 gallons. Excuse me, I was, <laughs> was 12,000 gallons short. That's all right. We thought, you know, for a man dedicated to wind power, that's a lot of gasoline. <laughs> well, I'll tell you what's what, what that had to do with. I'll, I'd like to tell you about the story first, all because right. this is of interest to me. On the day that President Carter made it public that he had fired half of his cabinet, a first in the history of our country. I was on the front page of newspapers in London, Tokyo, Los Angeles, New York, and Sydney, Australia, about my gas tanks. <laughs> and the story purportedly said that I had uh, 16,000 gallons worth of gas, enough to drive my Porsche around the world some 20 times. Now, here's the story. There are about 50 people altogether who work for me in the Roaring Fork Valley in Aspen, Colorado. Some of them who are working on the Windstar project, who left forty and fifty thousand dollar a year jobs to come work for me, are not getting paid, but they believe in the project. And one of the things that I thought I so we are building this ourselves. You see, we're not contracting it out to anybody. I understand. So one of the things I thought I could plan ahead for and take care of in regard to supporting my people in this project was look at the situation that was going on, and like most smart farmers and ranchers around the country, and like the movie studios, get some gasoline get some to gasoline. take care of my people. And I ordered gas tanks to uh, do that. And because of, of the size of things I was going for, they're, they're custom. They don't just have those laying around, like the 100-gallon or 500-gallon tanks you see on farms and everything. So I ordered them, and the first one got delivered. And this story broke. I never had any gas. I don't have any gas tanks anymore. And I still don't have any gas. You know, it got to be such a big thing for people that they started using that, just as you suggest, to negate both what I feel I'm doing with, with my life, but more specifically, the Windstar but Project. But you see, only part of the story comes out, John, and this is a shining example of it. They Absolutely. don't put in the rest of the story. Absolutely. The question is, how didn't you just see it when you saw it? Yeah, yeah. I was a little tense. Yeah. <laughs> a little tense, huh? But I, uh, not tense about it, just, you know, angry. Because it was a stupid story, and it's, a, and it's an example in my mind of how how ludicrous the operation of some of the press is in this country anymore. You know, I don't read, I, I don't believe what I read in newspapers or, or in the periodicals, just out of experiences like that in my life. And at the same time, then what happened is that everybody wanted to get to me about the story. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't make it a habit of doing interviews too much anyway. And so why should I start all of a sudden going on a bandwagon about this and being real defensive or whatever? I didn't care to see anybody. All of those who'd gone so far to put, pick up the story in the first place ought to do a little, be able to do a little research on their own and find out the truth of the story with or without my uh, assistance. And I chose not to be a very assist, assistful. Yes. <laughs> in other words, find it yourself. Yourself, right. yes. Yeah. Well, 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 a, a deep throat, you were shallow throat on this. Yes, uh, I hope so, yeah. yes. Let me do these uh, commercials. We'll continue with John Denver right after these announcements. John, you've never been afraid to express your views on politics or the causes in which you believed. So I'd like to just hear your observations following the election of Ronald Reagan, the, the Senate going to the Republican Party, the apparent swing to the right in this country. In your view, just as a citizen of this country, what do you think? Well, I think that we're faced with many problems in the world today and that people are really living in a, in a deep kind of frustration about what is going on and the seeming inability of anybody to do anything about it. And certainly we've had a, a certain more liberal element uh, involved in, in the administration of our government over the last few years. Mm -hmm. And what the people have said very loudly is that they want to make a very specific kind of change and give somebody else a chance to handle these problems. Uh, there are some things I'm concerned about in regard to uh, this, this new administration, uh, in regard to what's going to go on with 
nuclear power and what's going to go on with the environment and the lessening of uh, government restrictions on certain aspects of pollution that have to do with pollution in our environment. At the same time, I think it's a positive step because what's going to happen is we are going to have a new approach, a very different approach to dealing with all of these problems. And I don't think that the problems are going to be solved, and I don't think that, the, that this administration is going to be able to do anything about it. And so the people will then perhaps try to find out what it is that's missing. Where can we do something Do you ever get it? suspicious about all the, the anti-pollution laws that we've passed, all the Clean Air Acts that we've passed, both federally, states, and localities, because the air doesn't seem to be that much cleaner anywhere that I've been recently. Los Angeles, and, well, now they've had those things on the cars, catalytic converters since 1963, and it's still terribly smoggy in Los Angeles. You know, for all the things that we try to do to keep the air clean, where's the clean air? Well, it's a pretty nice day here in New York today. Today's a pretty good day. <laughs> and uh, you get, ask yourself, get yourself out on the beach in California, it's pretty nice. Get yourself up in the mountains, it's glorious. And uh, it's a problem with our technological society. And it's not just cars, but it's certainly not discounting all of those things. I think that some government restrictions are ludicrous. I think our approach to some problems gets to be much more of a problem than that which we're trying to uh, uh, deal with in the first place. But the thing is, is not to lose sight of the necessity of being aware that this is a problem mm -hmm. and that we have, to, you know, we have to keep it in balance someplace. As much as we are directed so full ahead in regard to progress in this country, we have to be aware that there are some things that we cannot lose just to continue progressing. What government regulations in your mind are ludicrous? I know I'm asking you at, the, at, at a very tired moment in your life for instant recall on something, but you said you think there are even some government regulations that in your mind are ludicrous. I don't know that I can pinpoint a specific okay. regulation, but there's, there's an approach sometime that the bureaucracy gets into that you know, in, in dealing with a certain situation, they, they just make it more muddy than it was initially with how they handle it, how they want to fund it, how they expect the people they're dealing with. It's like I, I read something a few weeks ago about, I think, some, some uh, coal company or, or something in, uh, in Idaho or Utah, and uh, they had already spent, you know, like $57 million to, to deal with pollutants that they were putting in the atmosphere before the government, before the people around them started screening. Mm -hmm. and, and they did that, and then the government screened a lot, and so they, they took care of what the government was for, and uh, are now, you know, they've, they've got an incredible efficient operation going on there, and pollution really has lessened, but now, from a general approach, they have to spend another $50 million to do something that isn't, isn't going to mean anything. Do you ever dream about how much fun it might be to get a Ford car with a 365 horsepower V8 engine with no pollution controls on and drive it 65 or 70 miles an hour just one more time? Well, <laughs> just once. I have a Porsche <laughs> that I drive pretty rapidly. You do? When, okay. I, when I get the chance to. Okay. Uh, generally, at the speeds I drive it, that particular car is still more efficient than most of the automobiles on the highway today. But you would admit there's a certain kick to driving a car at a speed more rapid than 55 miles per hour. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Can I push you to work for a couple seconds with your guitar? I'd love to do okay, that. Wait, before you go, what have you got planned? Well, I'm going to take a break. I've just finished recording an album, and uh, I want to take a break and be with my family for a while and be at home and really rest and, and sort of clean myself out a little bit. Uh, we had quite a large tour in this country this past year, and I hope next year to go to Japan and to China and, uh, in fact, do a world tour. What are you going to do for us tonight? Uh, this is my most recent composition, if you will. I wrote it about three weeks ago Sunday, and it's on the new album. It's called Perhaps Love. Okay. Unclip that little mic there. Thanks. And thanks for coming tonight, John. It's a pleasure being with you. All right. Thank you, sir.